Now Lebo to the right hand, puts her down. He's going to dump him hard to the ice. Brady Lebo just loves to fight. Ladies and gentlemen. My dream of being a professional hockey player became a reality, but it was all taken away from me in a very short period of time. For many years, hockey was my outlet. Hockey was my drug. When I had a stick in my hand, nothing else mattered. I was able to break into the Western Hockey League in 2004, and I even won the Swift Current Broncos Rookie of the Year. During the summer of my rookie year, I experimented with drugs for the first time. After just seven games in my sophomore season, I walked away from the Swift Current Broncos due to personal reasons. Nobody knew I had been sexually abused at the age of five. I did everything to hide it from everybody, but I just couldn't take it. Drugs and alcohol now took over my life. I did return to the Swift Current Broncos as a 19-year-old, but things were never the same. I was eventually traded to the Kelowna Rockets in my final year of junior where I got to play on a line with the Dallas Stars captain, Jamie Benn, and one of my best friends, the extremely talented Colin Long. It was by far my best season ever, and I even signed with the Tampa Bay Lightning's organization. A dream come true, right? That's when everything went wrong. First it was the cocaine, then came the Oxycontin, and that led me into a 12-year journey into the deepest pits of hell. Within two years, I had now made the switch to heroin, fentanyl, and everything in between, and I was now an intravenous drug user. Multiple suicide attempts and over five trips to the psych ward, I was a shadow of who I once was. By 2014, I was homeless on Hastings in Vancouver, the worst street in North America. By 2015, I was a wanted criminal, making the Crime Stopper headlines more than once. After spending three years in jail, I had completely given up. With nowhere to turn and nowhere to go, I finally started to get honest. I took a chance and made some major changes. This is my story. I overdosed over 10 times. I'm one of the lucky ones. And for that, I will always be grateful. This is for all the men and women we've lost. Matthew Lazinski, Mitch Fadden, this one's for you. My name's Brady Liebold, and I've been to hell and back. This is the road to recovery. What is going on? Welcome. Hockey to Hell and Back, episode number 101. I am Brady Liebold coming at you guys live from beautiful Muskoka, Ontario. It was absolutely gorgeous here today, but I've been kind of feeling off for the last week with my mental health. I don't know how much we're going to dive into that tonight, but I'll tell you, two years clean off of all that garbage that, you know, claim the majority of my good years, I would say, my adolescent years. And uh, life is still, still a struggle some days. So, you know, everyone out there, hang in there. I'm going to hang in there. We got a great show that I'm so excited. We got Danny Probert, Tierney Probert, and Declan Probert from the Probert family. We're going to talk about their lives and the, and the Bob Probert ride, which is now in its final year. Uh, I'm so excited to do so. Uh, but before we do so, this show is proudly brought to you by the great people at True Temper Hockey. Without them, I don't know where I, where I would be. And uh, I'm back on the ice coaching kids again. And I can't even tell you guys what a gift that is. I've talked about it briefly on this show. Uh, but, you know, I would, I, I would essentially probably pay to coach some of these kids because I have so much fun. I always ask them, I'm like, I don't know who's having more fun, me or you guys. Um, but uh, it's been just such an amazing experience to get back on the ice and uh, to have parents come up to me and like want me to work with their kids after everything that I've gone through. It just goes to show that, you know, people really can change. And and when they do that, people are there to support them and believe in them. And that's certainly been the case for me. And uh, I can't even put that into words. So a quick message uh, from my good friend, Regan Bartel and the people at Team Issue. And we, we will be right back with Danny Tierney and Declan Probert. Hi there, it's Regan Bartell, the play-by-play voice of the Kelowna Rockets, Brady Leovold's biggest fan. 
Team Issued is connecting all walks of life. Team Issued does this by recreating that special feeling of being a part of something bigger. A community for all striving towards the same goal. TeamIssued.ca. Promo code TOEDRAG15 for 15% off. Shout out to Jesse Paradise. I say it every show, but he was my second guest. He was a teammate of mine uh, when I was on the Kelowna Rockets. He was just 16 when I was 20. And when I called him, out of the blue, after not talking to him for probably 10 years, and was like, hey, I started this show. I've done like two episodes, had one guest. I have no idea what I'm doing, but I would love to have you on. And he's like, yeah, tell me when to be there. By the way, I'll sponsor your show too. And I was like, man, thank you. And uh, at the time, I had no clothes really either. Like I had nothing. And he sent me probably like $2,000 worth of team issued stuff. And he's like, hey, man, have at her. We gave a bunch of stuff away and my closet is still filled with so much team issued stuff so thank you jess love you man never ever forget that uh but let's get into the show what an honor to have danny back on the show she is my most viewed podcast to date and i was just mentioning that to her before the show shout out richard greenup pointed that out to me earlier in the week and uh since then i've been able to connect with tierney and declan and declan and i have done a live video together on her page and tierney was in there and We've been able to develop a friendship and uh, their support just means the world to me. So without further ado, let's bring them in. There they are. Hello. We're back. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and lots has changed, right? Like it's uh, it's so nice to see you guys and the world has kind of opened up. It was crazy times, Danny, when we connected and I kind of laughed earlier. I, was, I had no teeth. I went back and watched that show and the lighting was so bad. I don't even think you could see my face. And it was just, you know, probably didn't even want people to see my face, but you were so kind. And um, just thank you for, for coming on and thank you for everything over the, the course of the last year and a half, however long it's been. It's It's been a minute. We were just trying to figure it out. It's been about a year and a half and love doing the show with you. So thank you for having us back. Yeah, any anytime. And uh, you guys just announced that you guys are in the final year of the Bob Probert Memorial Ride. But for people that don't know, which I'm sure most people watching this show know, tell us a little bit about the ride and how it got started and kind of what it's meant to you over the years and how it's grown. Um, the ride started, uh, it was a, a couple of months after Bob had passed away. And I think we had discussed this before, Brady, but everybody came out of the woodwork and had all these wonderful fundraising ideas and wanted to honor Bob. And I just couldn't say no when there was golf and there was other things going on and posters, et cetera. But um, finally it was uh, Dino Kyoto, Don, Donnie Kaderi and, and uh, Ted Boomer from the area that approached me. And Donnie's one of Bob's, was one of Bob's best friends and they wanted to do a ride and for um, raising funds for cardiac. So it just seemed like the perfect fit since Bob had such a passion for bikes and um, it was uh, something that I was really, yeah, look at that poster <laughs> from way back. Look at that on the move. We still have that. It's in the garage. Did you get your license yet there, Brady? Get it? Yeah, I, I want, I needed to address that. We're having some, <laughs> we're having some issues from my past life still on that. So uh, we're working around that. But hey, at the end of the day, I'm going to come down on June 26th and I'll be there to support the ride. Anyway. Are you really? He's yeah. on the VIP bus. Woo! Awesome. That's yeah. fantastic news. That's news to me. I didn't know. Now you know. Okay. <laughs> Very nice. I love it. But, but that's going to be waiting. I'm not getting rid of the move. That's sitting in the garage. I'm going to have it all cleaned up and oil changed. And when you get your license, are you ready to ride it? That's the one right there. Oh, geez. Look at you, Danny. Holy. 1993. Oh, my God. Look at Dad with the leather headband. <laughs> I think that's leather. Yeah. I think it's he, he could He could totally pull that off, though. And, like, who's going to say anything to him? Absolutely. You know what I mean? Like, he could do anything he wants. And, and nobody would say anything to him, or at oh, least yeah. it would be stupid, too, right? So Half our um, wedding he spent with his teeth out. So you were talking about our last podcast. That was yeah. Big Bob. Totally. He hated wearing his teeth. Yeah, they're they're pretty uncomfortable, and uh, I don't know. There, it's a nice option to have, um, but I don't know. I think when you're playing hockey and you're you're 
you're still kind of in that life. It's not that big of a deal. But when you come out of addiction and you look like hell and you have no teeth, it looks like I was just doing drugs for the last 12 years <laughs> that I didn't lose them playing hockey. So I needed to get them fixed, but I can certainly understand how uncomfortable they are. But I, I, I didn't want to cut you off with the picture, but I, I love showing those pictures and uh, because I know just let your eyes light up the same way they did the last time. But um, the, the ride has been such a success and it's has it grown quite a bit over the years? Um, I, I think so. I mean, yeah, I, I guess word of mouth and whatever. I mean, we, we put on an awesome event, if I do say so myself. <laughs> it was first class all the way, right from the get-go. And, oh, yeah, there's the, uh, wow, is that the fort, you guys? Yeah, that's okay. the fort. That's the first stop. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I mean, we've been working with, partnered with Hotel Du Grace Healthcare and having Unifor 444 is presenting sponsors from day one. And a, a lot of our sponsors have been on board from day one, have really helped us make it the huge success that it's been right off the hop. I know um, the foundation, Barb Seven, a couple of the girls, they were saying how the first year they thought, well, maybe three or 400 bikes. And that year, I think we had 700 that first year and it's just grown. I think our last year we had over 1400 bikes. So wow. it's grown and we raised over $1.2 million. Um, the past last year we raffled off a of bike since we couldn't have the event itself. And uh, we raised money for mental health. And this year, again, the funds are going to mental health and addictions. Um, just coming out of COVID and the craziness, uh, we just see such a need and it's, it's, it hits home for us as well. Like we've battled with, uh, mental health issues and addictions in the pro family, families. So, and that's, that's pretty public knowledge. So it's something that's near and dear to our heart as well. And we're proud to be raising money for uh, Hotel Du Grace Healthcare again. That's, uh, that's amazing. And uh, thank, thank you for sharing that with us. And I, I think a lot of people uh, understand uh, that Bob had some challenges through the documentary Tough Guy. I think it uh, kind of uh, opened the people's eyes that maybe didn't even know. Um, before we get into it, like when you guys go back and watch that and during that, um, what was that experience like for the three of you, um, like individually, if you don't mind answering that? And, and do you guys ever go back and watch that? Because I do all the time. That's why I'm asking. I've seen it like 150 times. You go first. Um, I've actually watched it a few times. I mean, the first time when we watched it, I think we watched it before it was even published. And we had a moment, like, we all were just sitting there and crying. Because there was a lot. Like, I didn't I didn't read the book. Um, I was too young. So when I first watched it, it was a lot. It was a lot to take in at first. And I don't know. I wasn't really prepared for it. But overall, I do. I get... Um, happy watching it to kind of see that his story is being told the right way um, and to have those uh, voice recordings as well like kind mm -hmm. of hearing it from his point of view as well I think is really nice to know and whatnot but yeah I do watch it I do watch it here and there um, but I don't know it's been it's been a while and and that's Declan on the right for it in case in case we were wondering Declan on the right Tierney on the left and of course Danny in the middle who wants to take it um, I can tell you that what Declan said, yes, we had the, the rough cut come in first and it was dark and it was um, right off the hop. You hear Bob's voice, which I was not ready for. I really wasn't. I wasn't expecting it. Like the first thing, as soon as it opened up was his voice that kind of threw me, had to, to turn it off for a second and kind of process that. And there were a lot of tears watching it. Um, we made a few changes to it minimal, but with working with the producer and, and director Jordy on that, um, there, there was just some stuff that was just too much for us, I think. And mm -hmm. uh, it took a while to process, that's for sure. It's really dark. And I think as a family, we had to, to realize that the best part of our lives with Bob aren't in that documentary. Mm -hmm. His sober years, there's a big chunk missing of his life. And that was, that was the good times for us, really good times. That's when these guys were born. That's when we lived in Chicago. And some might consider that just boring you know, everyday life, but it was so awesome for us. And um, I, we're going to keep that private. That's for ourselves. Um, and everything else that's in that documentary, that was already well uh, documented. Anybody could Google it. That information was here. I don't think there were any new, re you know, revelations in that one, but what do you think? Um, I had <laughs> thrown it to you. Dean. Well, um, <laughs> I did read the book when I was definitely too young against Danny's wishes for sure. Um, and I know that that had a big impact on me growing up because I had so many 
I guess, unresolved issues from that. I, I had so many questions and he wasn't here for me to ask. And I didn't feel it was appropriate to ask my mom because you were a newly grieving widow. And, and there was just a lot that I think I had to internalize with reading the book and I just never dealt with. I was very pissed off teenager all the time. I think a lot because of that, I just had no idea like what was going on. And then sort of push that aside when the movie came out, I think a lot of that resurfaced for me. And mm. uh, uh, that definitely had a big impact as well. I, I certainly didn't find it as positive an experience as I don't know, maybe some people did. I know a lot of people love the movie and I can appreciate that, but uh, mm. yeah, I certainly didn't have that take on it, but that's just my opinion. <laughs> no, and, 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 and that's completely <laughs> fair. And thank you for sharing that. And that's a really, you know, and, and that's a really important thing for, for someone like me who who like didn't what not part of the family and and just somebody who like honestly idolized your dad and and Bob right and so many people did um but it was just to be able to get a little bit of a glimpse into his like personality for me like you said the voice recordings and the different things and seeing him play with you guys on the christmas morning that kind of stuff it's just really nice to see because a lot of the stuff you see of him is just fighting but we all know that he was like the nicest guy off the ice right like the big teddy bear so um i kind of want to talk about that tierney you, you kind of brought it up um you know you and i have chatted uh, a little bit about it but um and i'm putting it on you because you're the oldest the oldest kid in the room you're not bro <laughs> rogan is the oldest but she's she's not with us tonight um but you said you had some unresolved issues and uh in your teenage years and and what did that look like for you and how did that manifest into your life tierney well, I think growing up, and I'm sure all the other kids could agree, like we idolized our dad maybe as much as everyone else did, if not more. It's like we thought he was this big teddy bear hero man that was like completely invincible. He could do no wrong in our eyes. Um, and so I had that opinion of him until the book. Not, I don't want to say that ever went away, but when the book came out, um, I learned a lot more there and there was a lot of confusion. I, I think I was 13 when I read the book. Um, so I, I mean, there was so much I didn't understand and, and so much I was just confused by um, with the addiction itself. And I, I don't know. I think there was a good chunk of it that was like, why weren't we enough to make him stop, you know, drinking or doing drugs or whatever. Um, and so yeah, I was kind of pissed off at the world of like, no, you guys can't be making fun of my dad or chirping him for doing these things. We read a lot of bad comments and that does some damage too. And I don't, I don't know if you guys can agree with any yeah. of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, that certainly certainly had an impact on me growing up. I, I definitely stayed away from drugs for that reason. I knew that society had such like a negative perception of anyone who's a drug addict but um so yeah for that reason i stayed away from drugs i had zero interest in doing drugs um but i guess me drinking was that i i would say that that played a big role in it because i knew that that i could i could go under the radar a lot easier with drinking as it's legal and i think like the party culture in north america is so heavily promoted that that, that was something a lot easier to get away with when Sorry to, was someone going to hop in there? When did you kind of notice that this was maybe becoming an escape for you? And, and maybe did you start to notice you had a problem with it? Um, definitely throughout high school. But like I said, then again, it was like the cool thing to do is to like drink and party. So it seemed more normal. Um, I think when it came to the points where I was doing it myself, when I wasn't in a party setting that I'm like, and it, it was a more frequent basis where it got into like a daily routine that I was like, okay, this is an issue that, and I felt I couldn't get out of that on my own. I, I realized that as much as I wanted to stop, I just didn't have the willpower to do so. And I, I knew I needed additional resources to help me. And, and you took that step and, and made that call, right? And, and initially yeah. while your mom was away, I think, right? I waited till she went off to Italy. And I made the call and I'm like, please help me. Um, and I think it was shortly after you came home. I'm like, yeah, I'm leaving. Um, I'll see you in a month. <laughs> Danny, Danny, as a parent in that situation, like, did you see that coming? Um, and, and how was your feelings on that kind of because you obviously had seen 
um, Bob go through quite a bit throughout his career and, and he stood by his side all the way. And um, now you have your daughter telling you, hey, she's going to go get help. And of course, that's great. But as a parent, how are you feeling? Um, I, I was floored. I did not see that coming. I mean, like Tierney said, like partying as a, a kid in high school um, or, you know, at post secondary and college and whatever she was. Um, I didn't think anything out of the ordinary, to be honest with you. She was such a responsible kid and with school and and with their and work and her work ethic and nothing, nothing was changing that way. Her personality, she was, um, she's always been my quiet kid. So, you know, her, you know, hanging back by herself or that wasn't unusual. So I really didn't see any signs. And I mean, coming from a relationship with Bob where it was so blatant, like everything was right there. Um, I think I, I thought I maybe would see more in my own kids. Um, I recognize some behaviors in other kids though. <laughs> but I just <laughs> but, um, is, that, is that passing the passing the buck to your left there? Is that what that was? <laughs> yeah. But with Tierney, no, that was a total shock. Yes, I was in Italy. We came home and I it was within a oh, I don't even think it was a week that I was home from my vacation and she had just taken all the, the steps on her own. She made the calls. She made, she booked her own flight. She did and she was serious and she was ready to do this. And I mean, I just I remember being shocked hearing it and just giving her the biggest hug and, and just, do you remember that? Mm -hmm. It was just so emotional. And I was just so proud of her for right. recognizing that in herself and, and needing the help and seeking it and, and doing it and putting in the work. And yeah, that, today it, it's often not the case where somebody takes that, that initial step right like that on their own. And it's, and it's something that I think a lot of people wish that they would have done instead of waiting so long. I know that was the case for me and so many, so many times, but it's taking that initial first step. Like when you know, you know, right. And I think it's really important to listen to those intuitions and, and listen to yourself and Tierney. It's awesome to, to hear that you're able to do that. And uh, just for people watching, we're not supposed to ask age, but Tierney, you're 24, right? So mm -hmm. this was your, you, this was about how long ago for people? I was watching? 22 when I went away. 22 so a couple years ago right i think we're right around the same time yeah time, time frame there right like mm -hmm. roughly and uh well now we can pass it over to declan since your mom threw you under the bus yeah what the heck <laughs> declan, <laughs> yeah. About it. no i know okay it's just fine. everybody watching okay brady and declan have talked about this in the yeah so I, yes. I don't want to give a bad <laughs> yes. Yes. sorry <laughs> just to be clear yeah we talked extensively we actually went over the time limit on instagram and had to do <laughs> Oh, that was good though. It yeah, was it was. Fun. So you're uh Declan, you're 20, right? 22. 22? What? Yeah. 22. Yeah. Why did I think you were 20? I thought you I were don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, maybe that was like a year and a half, two years ago when I first talked to you. She told me that. Yeah. Not, I have a bad memory. So That's tell okay. us okay. tell us a little bit about your experience. Uh, because you're a couple years younger. Mm -hmm. Um, you you have a twin brother, Jack. You two are the youngest for people watching and listening. He's not here obviously with us too and i'll just throw up a quick picture because he just where is it he's he's in the this one there like oh, there he oh. is right the baby boy right in the middle yeah 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 jeez <laughs> is, is, is he the last born was he the no, actually he's five minutes older than declan she's five. the baby officially the baby the baby almost almost choked there uh, <laughs> <laughs> Declan, um, yeah, I know that uh, you shared with me and we went live on Instagram. It seems like it was a long time ago. It must have been close to a year ago now, I would think. It was, yeah, it was after my one year sober. It was definitely after. And I think um, it was more, I want to say it was more towards the summer, but I could be wrong. I don't, I don't really remember, but it was a long, it was a long video. We did two parts. It was really good. Um, it was nice hearing about your story too. And then I kind of shared a little bit with you as well. Yeah, but I want to I want to hear a little bit more if you're if you're open to sharing and kind of like where like where it started for you. I mean, you're the um, you're looking up to your sister and Tierney. I'm not saying you're the reason or whatever, but you're kind. Were you kind of looking up to your older sisters and people that were kind of in that circle as older and trying to keep up? Or how did how did it start for you? And and when did you kind of notice that it was uh, you were kind of maybe liking it too much? Um, I think for I. 
Well, <laughs> I was in it for a few years, to be honest with you. And like, I've always struggled with mental illness, um, anxiety and depression. I think that's been going on uh, since right after my dad passed. Um, and we were all seeing like counselors and whatnot and that helped. But um, I think especially like at the end of grade school leading into high school, I think that's when everything kind of went downhill and more issues were arising. Cause like Tierney said too, um, like you were mentioning how people would say stuff to you about dad or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And like, that's how I found out a lot of the stuff too, is like, I didn't hear it from them. We didn't have that conversation cause I was so young still. So a lot of the stuff I wouldn't understand or I'd hear it through other people um, or like if we had to cross the border to go to Cedar Point and my dad couldn't come, I'd be like, why not? Like we didn't really see that clearly, I guess. Um, so there's a lot of unanswered questions. And then once you kind of grow up, you hear more and more. And I always opened the tough guy book and I read the, what is it? At the beginning the when prologue. it's, yeah, the <laughs> prologue, which is the worst part to read, yeah. to be honest. Um, so I'd always read it. And as soon as that would happen, I'd close it, not want to read the rest, whatnot. Um, but then, yeah, I, I ended up, getting into um, drugs and alcohol, and I relied on it a lot. I think it was an easier way to cope with the heavy emotions that I was feeling or the trauma and whatnot. And yeah, it just, it got out of hand. I didn't really realize either that it would be a problem because you don't think you're an addict. And like, especially in that situation too, um, it's so normalized and, and everyone's doing it like Tierney said and whatnot. So you don't really see that until it gets to the point where you're doing it on your own and you're isolated and you need that to feel better, I think. So, um, and then seeing Tierney as well going away. I didn't know that she was struggling either. Um, and when she did go, we didn't know what happened. Yeah, I didn't tell anyone. She didn't tell anyone. <laughs> like we didn't, we didn't know anything. I didn't even know she was gone, like to be honest with you. Um, so then she left and it was kind of, that was a big wake up call. And I know I've been asking, like I was asking my mom, like, for a while, like probably a couple of years. I was like, I, I want to get help. Like I, but like, we didn't really know. And I would see someone I'd constantly see a counselor and whatnot, but like, it just wasn't the fit for me. And then once Tierney went away and I saw her when she got back and that it's possible to kind of turn everything around and that you don't need to rely on this. And I really went to her for advice and to kind of guide me in that sense. Like this is worth it. So I need that information and I'm going to take the step and go as well. So I let we well at a breaking point she saw that and then she's like yep you're serious about this let's let's get you going so yeah oh, that's awesome that, I mean, this, it's not awesome that you went through that but it's awesome that you were able to to go get the help that you needed and danny i want to pose the kind of same question so now you're going through it again and it's your your baby girl how how are you feeling now was this as you mentioned you said you kind of saw it coming so it was a relief for you or where were you at um yeah, I'm going to say relief. Absolutely. I, I mean, I saw Declan struggling for a while. And as a parent, you look at it going, okay, how much am I overreacting? Am I thinking too much about this? Is this normal teenage stuff? You question a lot of your own parent parenting techniques. Like, am I doing this right? Handling this to the best of my ability? Yes, I was in counseling since Bob had passed. I had, I have a, a therapist that I see regularly and, um, I, I was reassured that basically a lot of this stuff was was fairly normal for what I knew. She was very sneaky, this one, I have to say. This one, this one <laughs> kept things under wrap pretty good though. Oh, yeah. And there was a few instances that were like, okay, you know, let's have a talk about this and the grounding and trying absolutely everything in the book. And when she was finally serious and she hit her breaking point, oh, I so knew it was real and I was so thankful that this was happening, that I had the resources, I made the phone calls and uh, was able to get the help from the NHL and, and and get her out to where she needed to go. And it was the best, Hers was a, her program was a little bit longer and it specialized, I don't know if I'm getting this mixed up, so correct me if I'm wrong, trauma and for your age group, right? It was all around, like it was mental health and addiction, but only from ages 18 to 26. Okay. And yeah. So and it was like a bigger group. I know yours was more kind of intimate, right? Mine was small. We went to two yeah. different places. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And so you said mentioned the NHL stepped in and, and helped with that. Well, because of our our uh, of medical our healthcare, right? That of we course. have and our insurance. So we and 
got to say it, doc, Dr. Dan, he's not mm -hmm. a doctor, but Dan Cronin is a huge part of our lives, has been and helped Bob uh, when Bob was going through all his stuff in California and just an amazing guy, an extended family member. And to call him, he's easy to talk to. Um, he helped Tierney out and uh, he definitely helped us in placing Declan as well. And the two programs that they found were awesome and they were amazing for the perfect fit for these two. That's, that's awesome. I love to hear that. What about some of the struggles coming out of there um, for either one of you guys? And what has it been like since um, turning your life around? Because as I mentioned in the intro, I think I had this idea that all I have to do is get off this these drugs and my life's going to be perfect, right? And I'm not going to struggle. And, and it was always this idea. And it's certainly not the case, but life is definitely better. Um, how's it kind of been navigating for you guys in recovery early on and, and today? Um, I, it was definitely tricky. I was the same as you where I'm like, okay, if I stop drinking then okay, my, all my problems are solved and life is going to be amazing. Um, and it certainly wasn't that it did take a ton of work when I got home. Um, because like going out with the same group of people that I would go out with before that was challenging because that was like the party crowd that I would go out with. And so there were certain expectations. People told me like, you're never going to stick with this. Like just take a shot or do like, there were certain people that weren't supportive. And so I've lost relationships over that. And then um, I think when there's some quiet time, you get to realize like, okay, I was drinking because of mental health issues and then like unresolved traumas and things like that. And you realize, okay, I don't have the same coping methods to use. So now I have to establish new ones because those problems are still there. Um, and they still need to be resolved. So it's one thing to just quit the substance, but the reason for using that substance, that's another whole nother ball game. You're absolutely right. And uh, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. It's something that I think about quite a bit and we talk about on the show. I just want to get to one comment. Graham Bonner, uh, former teammate of your dad's is watching, says, love the love you guys make my heart warm. Great rapport. I miss my brother, Bob. I still remember when we first met after Don Cherry's taping, ironically, the last time I saw my brother, and then he says, thank you, Danny, for being you. Love your wee brother, Brady. Mm -hmm. uh, shout out to Graham Bonner. Uh, friend of the show, been on the show, and uh, I can say it, he's uh, 20, I think he's going to be 26 years, correct me if I'm wrong, Bones, 26 years clean and sober. He, he works at, a, he's been in the treatment uh, space for a long time, like he works in a treatment center and he's won awards and done all sorts of stuff. He's just an incredible guy. So I just wanted to sneak that in there really That's cool. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Just so yeah, and he's a and and he's a trauma specialist, and you know him and I have talked extensively about that, and I think it's really, uh, it, I don't know, I, I I definitely didn't understand even while I was going through it, and definitely prior to being an addict, uh, really understanding why people use drugs in the first place, right? And and there's just so much judgment that comes with that. There's still such a stigma I find when we talk about addiction and substance abuse versus mental health, but um, you. I liked when you mentioned that the treatment center, Declan, was was mental health and addiction. It's not just, hey, we're going to get you off the drugs, but now we're going to we're going to look into your mind and into your traumas, and we're going to figure out and get to the bottom of it. Because if you don't do that, in my experience, you always go back. At least I did. Um, so tell us, Declan, when when you got out, um, how has it been for you, and and how is kind of getting back to life? Because you guys are both so, still so young right? Like 22, 24. And there's probably still a lot of people in your lives or maybe not in your lives anymore, like Tierney said, that are still kind of in that party scene. So how has it been? Um, I would say like coming home the first year, not even probably the first couple months, I would say was definitely really challenging. Um, just in the sense, like I had to take my time with going back to those social settings. Um, Cause there's just a lot for me. And I, and I made it clear with my friends and family too. Like I set those boundaries and I would let them know like when I was ready and I had great, a great support system in that sense with my friends. Cause when we would go out um, and if I was uncomfortable or if I wanted to leave, they would understand and they would leave with me right away or like they were very understanding. So that was, it made it a lot easier. Um, and I think just over time, like you just got to take baby steps and what you're comfortable with and you got to know what triggers you and, whatnot and kind of let the people around you know those triggers as well so they can kind of have your back and get you out of those situations um but kind of back to what you were saying about the facility as well is it was really nice because 
since they worked on that mental health and addiction, they had like specific therapists for each thing. So like there was a trauma therapist who really dove into um, the root of every problem. And then they had workshops with inside the facility. Like they really, they really went down and tried to figure out what was going on and kind of break you out of your shell. And I know a lot of people didn't want to talk, but by the end of uh, the period, they were all ready to share their story and they were doing a lot better. So I think that was a huge thing. Um, for me, and that's what's led me to want to become a trauma therapist as well. So it's just, I don't know, I think it changed okay. me, yeah. I, I love that. That's news to me. I, I didn't know, is this a new revelation in your life or is this something that, I know that you mentioned to me, I think before you wanted to work as maybe an addictions counselor, but now a trauma specialist. Yeah, well, I was looking into it more and I've, I went for mental health and addiction um, for a worker at school. And then I was looking into it more and I was like, the one thing that I think changed a lot for me was working with that trauma therapist when I was there. And like the things they have you doing too, it's just like, I don't know how this works, but it does. And it's, it's amazing. It's like a full 180. And I, I was really interested in that. And I think that's what I'm more passionate about is kind of unraveling all those layers and figuring out what what's going on and how we can cope with it in a healthier way. Um, so yeah, I don't, I think it's always, I've always wanted to get to that point, but I, it takes baby steps, right? You got to start somewhere and then hopefully along the line, I'll, I'll get to that point. Well, yeah, like I said, you're still a, you're still a baby, right? You're the baby you're 22, but it's, it's really awesome to hear. And I know that uh, maybe talk, if you got Danny, talk, brag a little bit about Brogan. Cause I know she's up to some pretty awesome stuff down there too. Right. All of my kids are, they're awesome. Yeah. Actually, Brogan's working right now up in her room. So she's in a meeting. She's hoping to pop in and say hi, but she's uh, just completing her second master's in, uh, she had the first one in sports psychology and the second one is organizational psychology. Did I say that right? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so she's working hard on that. She's doing the psychology stuff and she's loving it. And she has proper performance here, uh, working with some young athletes and that's been, oh yeah, she's having a blast doing all that stuff. And Jack just became an architect in Detroit. He just, uh, yeah, it's official. He's a, he's got a big boy job. So wow. he's in a group in Detroit and, uh, he's an architect and he'll be working on, on his master's uh, next year. And I think he just took off to go to the gym. He's an avid runner and workout guy. So hopefully he'll pop in and say hi too. <laughs> wow. The, the Probert family is well on their way, aren't they? Yes. It's, and this one got her master's from Scotland while we're of course locked down. She was supposed to go to Scotland, but she did it from her bedroom. <sighs> Yeah, actually, I think this table from this yeah. table, she did her master's program. Well, good for you for getting it done, because, you know, there's probably some people that would have just been like, you know, I'm just going to wait until I can go to Scotland or find like make an excuse to not do it. Um, what a challenging time to get into recovery too, like through the lockdowns and, and right before the lockdowns. Yeah. Yeah. And and. I don't know. I saw a lot. I don't know about you guys. You guys must know some people that are in, in recovery now too. Did you guys see a lot of people relapse um, through COVID? Because I certainly saw that. Did you guys hear about a lot of overdoses down in Windsor? Like what's the overall consensus wow. on mental health and addiction through the pandemic? Well, I could just say from being at the hospital at the time that, <clears throat> yeah, all of our rooms were full. We were like at capacity, mental health was going through the roof and hearing the stories out of that end of the professional end of it and hearing from the doctors, it was horrifying. It was just awful to hear that people who had leveled off with their meds and doing so well in recovery and the, the relapse rate that was up. Um, I don't know for you guys, for your friends yeah. or you did for friends from yeah. where you're at. Where, where I was at and I actually had someone who I was away with passed because they relapsed and overdose um, because they were so isolated. Like when you're so isolated and you can't really leave, it's what else can you do, right? So um, he fell back into that and it took over and it's sad to say, but I'm so happy I got to have him a part of my journey. And I, I just know a lot of people, it, it was difficult, like the isolation and being um just so in your own head and not being able to rely on that and then trying to kind of hide it away from your family or loved ones too. Like a lot of people are ashamed to talk about it. So yeah. did yeah. you do meetings and stuff? Do you, are you your after program? 
So I, I, I've done a ton of meetings this time. I, I really didn't. I've done a few more meetings now where I actually like go to meetings as a guest speaker more often than, than going to like a specific home group. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I just found, I was doing so many personal meetings on like a daily basis, like talking to people and I was running groups early on and, uh, I didn't really like follow like one program this time. Like I had tried everything for me. I had tried everything, every rehab, harm reduction, 12 step detoxes, psych wards, like everything, right. Um, every medication, it seemed like that the doctor could prescribe and nothing worked until finally I'd just given up. And this time I pretty much just went back to the basics. I was uh, locked away in Utterson in nature in Muskoka in the middle of nowhere, got my skates back on for the first time. I was ATVing every day. And then, uh, you know, through the podcast, starting the podcast, I started to get like a lot of, uh, connections, uh, like people reaching out to me um, who were in similar situations or had recently been out of situation or uh, a loved one is in the crisis. And I just couldn't believe how many people, um, you know, just based off like a small following and people just a small group of people hearing what we're talking about, even like tonight and just how impactful it is because I understood that every single family will be impacted by this on one way, like in one way or another, like that's really like generally speaking, one in four people, if you don't know somebody that has been affected by mental illness or addiction or both, please tell me, I say this all the time, find, find me that person and send them to me because it's so prevalent and now more than ever, right? No, you're absolutely right. And that's why I asked about the aftercare program for Declan, she got away on in March and they were just closing the border and everything was just shutting down. We got her out of here just in time. So when she came home, I mean, she didn't get to do a lot of the things that they typically do at that facility that she missed out on because of COVID, like going to the horses and stuff like that. Oh, I got to do that. I just couldn't have you guys. Oh yeah, we didn't. And like we were allowed to family to, time. Yeah. And we weren't allowed to, they usually bring in or they'll do like bring us to something with huge groups and meetings and we get guest speakers, <laughs> but we couldn't do that. It was all through zoom. And even our family week was on Zoom. Um, so there was a lot we missed out on. But And then coming home for an after program, yeah. you had to stay in touch with the facility. It's not like she could go to a meeting. Either one of them, they couldn't go to open meetings or closed meetings yeah. for that matter because there wasn't anything. Everything was shut down. So, yeah, that, that was challenging a little bit. It's nice, though, because they give you the option. I know at least for my facility, I don't know about UT, but they <laughs> send emails. Um with links to a bunch of different live meetings. So, and it's mainly the people like alumni from that facility. So you're comfortable still, you kind of know some of the, the workers or who's leading the, uh, the meeting that day. So I thought that was really, really helpful to at least have that when everything else was shut down. Um, For sure. And the, the family, the family program and, and whether or not anybody goes to uh, treatment or not for somebody, I think, going through addiction as a family member. And uh, really, I think more I spend more time talking with people who care about somebody who's in an addiction versus then somebody reaching out themselves and saying, hey, I have a problem. That happens a lot, too, but it's more like a parent or a wife or a husband of like and and it's not just hockey anymore. It's like just people who are struggling. Right. And, uh, I guess I miss that like through and, and my family and this is, you know, kind of throw my dad under the bus, but I just don't think he knew. And, and I didn't really tell him how important family support is through when somebody's going through an addiction to educate yourself as the family member, as a mom, as a dad, whatever that is, uh, as a spouse to put yourself in the best position to understand what that person is going through and to look for the signs too. Right. Because we, I think parents often send their kids to rehab uh, for the first time. And this is a story that I've heard so much in the last couple of years where they really don't know what to expect. And they're like, okay, well, my kid's going to rehab and, and, you know, we're just going to listen to everything that they say. And, and we're just going to go there and they're going to go there and they're going to get better. And I got to stay here and continue my life. And then they're going to get better and they're going to come back and everything's going to be good. And that's not reality because so often the parents also have to, uh, and I'm not saying you, Danny, but parents often have a part to play in it, whatever that is. And, and I found that if parents don't put themselves in the best position to like educate themselves and to be kind of on top of their loved one, that it becomes uh, just a way tougher situation to navigate. Well, I have to say for your dad's, just to have his back on this one, had I not gone through everything that I 
to hell and back with Bob. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. I don't know if I would have handled everything the same with the kids. Yeah. But it, it, I mean, I had the experience. We'd been through a few rehabs together and that whole experience. And I remember young, naive, I mean, ignorant Danny. I didn't know one of the treatment centers of Bob, you know, calling me out. I had to go out for the family week and uh, I had just had Brogan. I think she was a couple of weeks old and they needed me out there for this intensive thing. I was such a bitch. I really was. I was like, I'm not the one with the problem. Why do I have to go out there? I got to uproot my, me and my daughter and go, you know, I, I had an attitude and I ended up finding out real quick that I had my own issues I had to deal with. And if, you know, I had to work on me and Bob had to work on him and we had to work on our relationship together. And uh, that took a lot of work and that was a real eye opener. So I think that going through that um, gave me the tools that when my own daughters came to me to talk to me, I was open and, you know, I mean, I was always looking for signs. I couldn't, we could, you know, how can you not uh, coming out of that with, with Bob that, you know, you're always looking at your kids. Are they doing anything a little off or looking for any signs that way? But when they came to me, it was, it was relief and it, and and a sense of pride that they recognized this in themselves and they wanted to get the help. And then there was a lot of prayers that this was going to stick. Yeah. Because no, going to rehab, that's not a magic, you know, fairy dust that you're sprinkling on your kid as you send them out the door thinking that this place has a, a magic wand and they're going to, you know, fix your kid. No, there's a lot of work that goes into it from all parties involved. Yeah. And I think that if you want success and sobriety and that path, that it's, it's imperative that, you know, you learn as a parent and you listen. That's huge. And, uh, you know, you just, you got to sit back and let your kid talk and you have to listen. So. Yeah. I, I can't imagine, you know, I have kids, but they're, they're pretty young. So obviously they haven't gone through anything like this, but I can't imagine, I, I think of my dad and, and, and people who really have no control over seeing somebody go down that dark path and, and how hard that, that really is. Um, but it must feel pretty good to sit next to those two today, knowing that they're on the right path. Right. Absolutely. And it's just, I mean, I'm blessed. I have a great relationship with, we're a very close family. And I don't know if that stems from losing Bob when we did 12 years ago. And at the ages they were at, that just were like a fair family. We're so close and we love hanging out. We like each other's company and we like having game night and, and chilling out and ordering in and just hanging out. It's it's a lot of fun. And I know that's not the norm. So yes, for them to be on this path and to be a part of that and to still have them all home, they're, they're getting ready to leave the nest, but it's, um, it's, it's pretty awesome. I'm so He'll stay forever. I'll stay. <laughs> I was going to say the baby. But yeah, Tierney, you're, you're talking about moving to Texas, right? I'm um, counting down the days. I can't wait to get out of here. How, how many days? <laughs> Actually, I don't know. What? No more games. She's like, enough game nights. I'm going yeah. to Texas. this. <laughs> okay. Yeah, right. Yeah. I love the game nights. I, love I know you do. Guys. You guys should all move to Texas with me. Okay. I would go. <laughs> I, yeah, I would, I told Tierney this the other day when we chatted, I said I would move to Texas. I lived down there for a bit and I never wanted to leave. It's just, it's like a different world down there. The people are great. Um, the way of living is great. I don't know. I love it. And it just seems like it's the last, the last frontier of normalcy in North America. So, right. right? <laughs> um, do you guys have a favorite story about Bob, about your dad? And do you ever, uh, there must, people must talk about him to you guys all the time. Do you ever get sick of hearing the stories or is it something that you just absolutely love to hear? Danny's going, no, I love it. I um, love the stories. Yeah, we never get sick of them. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. We like the good stories. Do you, have a, do you have a favorite? Like, is there a favorite story that people maybe tell you that you hear often or something that just lights you up? I'll let you guys go. <laughs> no, this isn't, this isn't what um, anyone's told me. This is my own experience. Um, but my mom, like we used to all love getting our back scratched at night, like to fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> and every time my dad would always take me to my hockey tournaments. She would be with Jack. Um, but I remember just laying there and I don't know if you were out of town with Jack or whatnot, but he came in and this big guy, and he lays in Brogan's bed with me and he's singing to me and he's scratching my back. 
but he doesn't have any fingernails and his <laughs> and his hands no, are all crusty yes. and like gross. All callous. Yeah, all callous. I'm like laying there, he's just scratching. Like, a cheese <laughs> on back. like it was awful, but it was so funny. So I, I always remember that. That's why, right there. Right. That's it. Right yeah. There. yeah. <laughs> His hands were pretty chewed up. Oh, I love that story. That guy's so <laughs> gross, but it was so funny. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks. I can never come up with one on the spot. Really? Yeah. I have so many. I don't know. I think the big tough guy, did I say this the last time we were talking? I don't even know because this is my favorite, one of my favorites. Um, when Bob, when we had a rattlesnake situation at the cottage, did I share that with you? I'm not sure. Okay. Our cottage up in Tobamori. Yeah. The twins weren't born yet. I might've been just pregnant with them. And we were up at the waterfront and early morning, Bob sipping his coffee on the deck and reading the paper, um, probably having a couple of darts. I don't even know. And the Tierney and Brogan went down to feed the ducks. And I was right behind them and I could hear this strange noise. And sure enough, it was a rattlesnake. And I hate snakes. I have an irrational fear to begin with. But I heard this noise and here are my babies down on these rocks. That thing's going to just take them down. And I'm trying to stay calm and get them away from the rocks. And I'm trying to call Bob down. So I'm trying to get the kids away from the rocks. I'm trying to have Bob come and save the day. And as soon as he came down finally, uh, and I told him there was a rattlesnake, he jumped up on the picnic table with us. <laughs> He was zero help, Mr. Tough Guy. Zero help in the rattlesnake situation. So that's one of my favorites. That's so good. I love I could call in the game warden to come and take the snake away. That's what he did. What? I thought he loved snakes. I remember. Oh, he loved snakes to pick them up, but the yeah. rattlesnake situation really true. Oh. I know. Yeah, it's it's like one of those unknown things that it's like you just don't even want to test that your whole life you're, it's like you get bit by a rattlesnake you're done right that's at least my my idea that of, of that kind of snake so i don't mind snakes but i'd probably be right on that i'd probably be running never mind on the picnic table. <laughs> he jumped up on that picnic yeah table so fast i don't even i think he leaped onto there it was hilarious uh, you know, right. had it all, yeah. Yeah. oh my gosh well the video for sure yeah we have video um too. i do have one um, I think this is where my fear of blood stemmed. I have like a oh. horrible fear of blood. <laughs> um, and at the old house, my dad used to have all this like car equipment to work on his cars <laughs> that like never got built. Uh, so he had this big sander. And one day he was out there and just Brogan and I were home. And he's working <laughs> on the sander and he ran his hand through it. And from like here to here, this skin was hanging off of his hand. And it's just <laughs> like <laughs> hanging. And he comes out of the house and he's like, T, you gotta cut this off right now. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and then he's yelling at Brogan. Brogan's trying to do it. She's got the scissors. She's looking the other way. He's like, you gotta look at it. Cut it. You're gonna cut my thumb off. And we're like, <laughs> it was horrible. We managed to get, well, Brogan managed to get off. I went nowhere near it. But now I can't think of blood ever. Yeah. That's so funny. That's like, those are great stories. I really that appreciate it. So <laughs> Don't so, the duck call. What about the duck call? Who can I do that? Duck can do it. <laughs> that was how Bob located the kids. What? The grocery oh, store. Can you, can you do it? No. <laughs> the duck call? I can okay. take my teeth out. That's all I got. That's my one trick. I take my teeth out and that's where it ends. Do the duck call again. Do it again. That's we'd, do that. we'd be in grocery stores or at the hockey arena and you would be like, we wouldn't know where he was and you just hear that and then you'd find okay, our way. dad. Yeah. Yeah. All That's so cute. He That's... was home for the duck call all the time. It was awesome. How how long did you play hockey for, Declan? Ooh. When did I start? Oh, you were young, like five. Okay, and then I stopped, uh, I'd say grade 12. So Yeah, because then you played high school. You played travel hockey and then I high played, school. No, I played travel, house league, and high school. So do you ever consider putting the, the gear back on and playing oh, hockey I again? I love it. I was actually just talking to um, someone at my work the other day and I was like, I really want to look into, you know, they have female beer leagues, um, but they actually are like not super competitive, but you all get your own teams and like there's a winner at the end. So I'm like, I, I would love that just to get on the ice again and play with people. And like I play pond hockey when it's, when the lake's frozen and whatnot, but I haven't been actually playing a real game in so long. And I'd love to. Yeah, well, I think I think you should do it. I don't know how much time you have on your hands with whatever you're going to have going on, but it's uh, I don't know for me, anyways. Like you started at five, and I don't know how much you loved just skate. Like I just love being on the ice. I could care less about the competitive side of the game now, and like the the whole. I have no time for that. I just want to be on the ice, 
you know, with kids or by myself or with whoever, just doing what, like just having fun. Right. And yeah. men's league, whatever, even sometimes that for me can get carried away. Cause there always seems to be one asshole that wants to fight and try to do something. And it's like, man, come on. Like, yeah. you know, I had some, actually I had some guy come up to me after I played in this men's league game and he came up to me and I had this ridiculous, I had like two different colored socks on. So I looked like there was like one neon green and like an orange, I had like red pants, this crazy Jersey. Rainbow, this, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> no teeth the mustache long hair right because i took my teeth out the guy came up to me like we shook hands after he's like he's like hey like they didn't know who i was or anything like that he's like hey man he's like why do i feel like if i google you i'm gonna find that you're like a character straight out of the slap shot movie and i'm like man if you if you google me you're gonna find out way more than you ever <laughs> you know and he just laughed right and uh, he ended up sending me a message but what a, what a, i don't know that getting back on the ice getting back to doing something that's for you and that you love whether whether it's hockey or whatever has been so important in my recovery anyway so i would love to see you get back on the ice or hear about it one day i would love it but the difference is i did like the like the competitiveness a little bit I, I love, yeah i did i love having fun 100 percent and like being out on the ice no matter what but i think that made it exciting for me and honestly i felt like a totally different person on the ice than i was off the ice you just feel a lot more tough right so um, my get away with my my buddy Stuart Smith, he's assistant fire chief out in Abbotsford, and he's actually the chair for the Puck Support Charity. He played junior hockey, and he's just an incredible guy. He's, there's a comment that I'll get to, but he just he just said this. He says we need Declan to join Puck Support ODR team next winter. So we have you guys saw that tournament that yeah. that outdoor tournament. The jerseys behind me, and I I told people that we we're going to start auctioning it off on Friday, but I then we were doing the show, so I thought we would talk about it a little bit now. Not I don't know how much money we're going to raise, but we're going to do it for the ride. And, and bring down the money or get the jersey i'll show in a second but we played for all the jerseys were made uh in in memory of a hockey player who, who we lost and um we got a jersey made uh, in your dad's honor of course and that's awesome um, i love it yeah, so and, cool, Brady. yeah and uh but we're gonna play in it again and it's up here on the wharf i think tierney i saw pictures of you up here for the tournament one time it was like the spit and chicklets guys were up here. Were oh, up yeah. here for that? So that outdoor tournament, that's what we played in. Like right, that's where it was like on the wharf here in Gravenhurst. And we're going to have a, a ladies team this year, Declan. So you might have to come up and play. play too. What you guys are, you guys are in, you guys are in, you got to come. We have yeah. to get yeah. Rogan doesn't play all the pro work kids. She's the only one who doesn't play. Yeah. Jack, Jack can play too. Can play on my team. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I would love to see a co-ed division in that tournament, but I'll tell you what an amazing event that on the pond they put on shout out Rob Carlton. He put it on and they were so kind to, to our team and to me and got to take, it was a pretty cool, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a pretty cool story and people have heard this one maybe, but during that weekend, so they did like the big opening ceremonies with the bagpipes and the O Canada and there's like 800 hockey players multi divisions and we were in the competitive division and like i didn't put together like some superstar team it was more about like who's playing on the team and why and uh, we ended up finishing third but we got to be in the opening ceremonies and i got to take like the opening uh face off like just a ceremonial puck drop with this other guy the they won the championship the year before all this stuff. And just before the puck dropped, the guy leaned in and he's like, this is exactly what he said. He's like the captain of the other, other team. And this was so foreign to me in the space of hockey. And I hadn't played in a tournament at all in years and years. And he leans in. He's like, Hey man, I fucking love what you're doing. I'm five years clean and sober myself. And I'm like, no way. Right. And that's how that that's. And he's like, and we got three guys on the team that are two or three guys that are on the team in recovery as well too. And he's like, and then that's how the tournament started. Right. And, it uh, it was a great event, and yes, some people come to party, but we were there for a different reason, and we just had such a such a great time. And I don't know what your schedules would be like, but it's in the end of February, and if you know, even if you came up for a day, it'd be awesome to have you up. But absolutely no pressure. We'll just put it on Stuart. He's the one that suggested it, but I was also thinking it. No, I would love that. That sounds I so much that. fun. Yeah, I would love it. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> we're yeah. you might be in Texas. I don't know how many how many outdoor rinks there are in Texas, but yeah. <laughs> they do have hockey in Texas though, and not just pro hockey. There are um there are some like random rinks in the middle of nowhere, at least where I was, where it's like, what the hell? There's just a random hockey rink. Like there's not one for like a thousand like five hundred miles, and then all of a sudden in the middle of nowhere, you're like, There's this hockey rink here, we're going to practice here. It was like what the hell? <laughs> but uh I, I, in Texas, where were you? I, 
I was in the Rio Grande Valley, but I got to spend like time in Austin and San Antonio and Dallas. But I spent the majority of time majority of the time in the Rio Grande Valley, which was uh, basically like the show Border Town, right? Like that was where I was. There was more Border Patrol vehicles than normal vehicles, it seemed like, and you could see Reynosa, Mexico, like from the parking lot of our team arena, which was like a nice arena. It was in the minors, right? But you could see the border of Mexico in the distance. It was like a seven minute drive, right? And there's so much, like there was some stuff that went on down there with the cartels, but I never felt like, and we were in one of the worst technically, you know, unsafe areas for that violence and stuff. And I never really saw anything. We saw stuff in the newspapers, these crazy stories, but I always felt safe in Texas. Even when people were packing around guns on their hips, it was like, well, yeah, it's like, but everyone has a gun on their hips. So people are super polite. Like you, you don't mouth off like you do in Canada because down there you might have to pay a price. It's just a different way of life. And I really quite enjoyed my time down there. Well, that's good to know. Is this I, I, some, I feel good about you going down there. That's good to hear. <laughs> I think she's going to be in Dallas, closer to Dallas. That's a little more of a, I was in like the outlaw part of Texas for the majority of the time, but Dallas is a, uh, is a great city. And I just love the people of Texas. Before I let you guys go, let's talk a little bit more about the ride. It's on June 26th and it's in, in its 10th and final year. Tell me a little bit, Danny as the the queen over there <laughs> decision um and maybe it was a family decision um on on calling it uh this is the final year for the bob probert memorial ride it was absolutely a family decision all the decisions we make for the ride we discuss around the table and if we can we include bob's mom um and i really did want to keep the ride going as long as she was around to be honest she really enjoys it but she her health has been declining a little bit so it's a, a getting difficult for her to spend the days with us it's a full day event really like we we open up the gates at 9 a.m and um you're not back to the final stop till around 3 4 o'clock so that's a full day that's a lot for her um but we did tell her we discussed it with her and um ultimately we decided as a family yeah we're gonna call it um, I, I remember joking, people would say, okay, 10 and out, you're going to go to 10 years. And I kept saying, well, 10 didn't sit well with me at the time. It was, you know, pre-pandemic and the craziness, and I wasn't ready for that. But um, I always joked that 12 was my favorite number. I was the better half of 24. So maybe we'll go 12 years. And I just, uh, it just didn't make sense. I was like, oh, you can't go to 12 years. No one else is going to get it. That's an inside joke. Well, oddly enough, it's been 12 years since he's almost 12 years since he's been gone. So technically it's the 12th year, but it's the 10th ride. And uh, it, it just, it's another sign that, yeah, it's time to wrap it up on a high note. All good things must come to an end. Uh, we might have some reunion tours down the, down the road. Yeah. But um, we just, we just really enjoy, we, we thank our community, everybody that's been involved in helping us celebrate and honor Bob for so long. We're so thankful for that. And uh, we look forward to June 26th. And I can't believe you're going to be here. I'm so excited. I'll believe it when I actually see you. Oh, I'm I'm there. I already have it. I've had it in my calendar for a year. And like I was supposed to be rollerblading across Canada right now. But because of COVID and trying to plan, it was never about like, oh, I'm going to start in PEI and I'm just going to rollerblade across Canada. It was about actually stopping in some of these communities, inviting people out, inviting the resources that were in the community to set up kind of shop and do like this little like mental health and addiction expo in these little communities communities as we go along and as we were trying to like you know talk like we got some sponsors that were interested and in, in trying to plan these events and the dates and 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 then it was like I don't know it was all of a sudden it was like January and everything was still closed and everyone was like confused and I was like okay well we can't do it because I'm supposed to leave in like four months and it's we have things planned but not planned the way that we want it and um and even then like we had it worked into the rollerblades so that I could be in Windsor for June 26th, like it was around that time, like at the end of June, like for, we've been planning it for it's over a year ago. It was in the works that it was in my calendar to be there. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't miss it for the world. And especially now that it's the last year, um, you guys added something this year too. We did the class. Oh, I was just going to hold up the poster. Yep. We're doing oh, go ahead. Go card ahead. Right there, that 70 show. Hold it up. So yours will look better. Yours, be yeah, this is this. You hold up yours. <laughs> look at that. 
Yeah, we had that Chevelle, 70 Chevelle LS6. Oh, yeah. Awesome car. Bob had such a passion for bikes and cars. As our family grew, his car collection grew. It was easier for us to pile up all the kids and go out for ice cream and stuff in a car than on the bike. So um, it made perfect sense. We had always planned on including the cars eventually. I'm hoping some of Bob's old cars that um, have since been sold make their way back. Dave Hutchison with the... Uh, he has the 71 Chevelle, the blue and white one, the make believe colors, because uh, he played for the Leafs. So that's nice. That's where that one is. And we have a 68 Charger out there and the 70 Chevelle. And um, the Monte Carlo will definitely be there this year. So um, a lot of, you know, awesome passions that Bob had that we get to include in one day. So we're really excited about that. It's so it's so awesome. Is there one, one um I don't know, highlight. I mean, there's so many, I'm, I'm sure. But looking back 10, 10 years, 12 years, uh, the 10th ride, could you have imagined it being such a success? And and where, um, I don't know, like, where did you see it from the first year until today? And and maybe what's the greatest accomplishment through the Bob Probert ride for you guys individually? Is there one or is it just? I, I mean, gosh, no, I never imagined it going this long. And I didn't imagine it growing the way it did and raising the money that we have for our community. Um, the people that come out that blows us away every year. Like we invite players and we reserve rooms for them, which I'll be doing for you tomorrow. So just let you know, but I just, um, it, it's just amazing who shows up. We never know what the players who is going to show up and then they share the story. So it's a nice reunion. It's a hockey family reunion for us. And um, the people that come out, we see a lot of familiar faces, a lot of new faces. And I love it when they share Bob stories. The kids love it. That's a, the best part of that day for us every single year. The first year of missing the ride, the first year of the pandemic was heartbreaking. Because this was something, this was like planning your wedding over and over and over again. So much work goes into it. Like you said, with planning your, your trip across Canada, there's a lot of organizing involved and a lot of phone calls. And a lot of, you know, looking at the calendar and rearranging things and, and putting everything into place for it to be a success and for things to run smoothly. So it's a lot of work to celebrate him. <laughs> On the level that we did, it was awesome. It's so worth it every year. It just was amazing. I'm looking back. I, I don't know if I even uploaded them but there i remember the last time i had you on uh, just looking at the pictures uh you guys the kids have grown up so much um over the years like some of the pictures like you look back and you guys were like just little like like young like jack and declan were young and like tyranny and tyranny and rogan look young too but they essentially look like they're like you know the big sisters and like there's just this big like i don't know and to see you guys you know you're you're young women now and to see where you're sitting uh, in recovery and to just to own your life and to take it back. I'm just so proud of you guys. And I just so appreciate your guys's like love and support, Danny, especially like you're the one that really introduced me to your family and kind of allowed me in. And I have to give a shout out to DMAC because without his, you know, co-sign of approval. that Absolutely. It was Mitzi who gave the stamp of approval. Yep. Talk to Brady. He's a cool cat. So yes. And he has become, uh, he's become one of the big brothers I never had to, and uh, just super grateful for him. And um, yeah, I was really nervous that first time talking to you. And I think maybe even more nervous talking to the three of you guys tonight at the beginning. But once I settle in, it's like, oh, well, if I choke on my words, I choke on my words. It's happened before. It's going to happen again. That's just, that's just the reality of this, this business for me, because I'm a hack. I'm no professional, but uh, I'm going to see you guys June 26th in Windsor. And I'm so excited and just honored to be a small part of it and can't wait to give you guys all a hug. And um, I just so, so, so appreciate your guys' friendship and support. It means the world to me. And, um, you know, Danny, you're, you guys are always welcome on the show. And if there's anything that I can do to either help you guys, if anything you guys are doing or individually, uh, that goes for Brogan and Jack as well. I'm always here for you guys. And um, yeah, I'm always just a phone call away. I think you guys both have my phone number, the three of you guys do anyways, I think. So don't ever forget it. And I just really appreciate you guys opening up 
um, your personal lives. And I know you've done it before, but coming on here and just sharing this time and space with me and the viewers and listeners, um, I know people appreciate it. And there's a bunch of comments coming in. I'll just get to one quickly because I don't want to keep you guys too much if I can find it. I just uh, want to reach to the screen and give you a big hug. I can't wait to meet you in person and give you the biggest hug. Oh my gosh. My, my buddy Brody says, appreciate the sharing of your stories and honesty. Um, Bones, Bones had one more I wanted to get to because you mentioned ice cream and he said, when Danny spoke of Bob pushing ice cream in Danny's nose, I did this to Bob, told him when that special lady comes into your life, try this. <laughs> yep. One of our first dates. Smell the yogurt. My yogurt's bad. Smell this. I smelled it and I got yogurt up the nose. <laughs> and hey, it worked. That's all your fault. Bones, that's all your fault. <laughs> Yeah, it, uh, but it it certainly worked. So I'm gonna I'm gonna be down there uh, with Susan Cook, who's like the other half of Puck Support. She's actually Harry Sinden's niece. She was the, he coached the '72 Summit Series, and he's worked for the Boston Bruins from 1966, maybe '65 until today. He is 90 years old. He's in the Hockey Hall of Fame, and uh, so I'm, I always tell people this. And there was I was with a guy earlier who. We, he's from Ontario, but we were talking about the 2011 Stanley Cup riot in Vancouver versus Boston. And so I was telling him, like, in front of me, you guys have no idea. Like, you guys have Red Wing stuff and Ch Chicago stuff. Probably it's just all Boston and it's just everywhere, like everywhere I look. And it just pains me so bad because much like Leaf fans, the Canucks have never won a Stanley Cup and probably won't in my lifetime either. Do you guys, before I let you go, I got to ask. Where's your stance on hockey? Like, do you guys are you guys hockey fans? Like, do you guys watch hockey? Are you into it, or is it just sort of like, uh, meh, meh, yeah? Meh. When a game's <laughs> on, I enjoy watching it, but yeah. I'm not. It's not like I'm keeping up. Yeah, yeah. but I, I do enjoy watching a game. I miss the fighting. Yeah. <laughs> Go miss, Tampa. That's all I got. <laughs> miss the fighting. You yeah. miss the fighting. So you guys, yeah, I have to ask now the stance on fighting because you saw how much of a toll it played on, on Bob's life. Right. And, and what that did. So the stance on fighting, I, I still think there's a, there's a needs to be in the game. And if you take it out completely, I'm not sure you ever can, but if you did, I just feel like, I don't know. I feel like the game in general has gone downhill. I went, I watch a lot of junior hockey this year and I'm like, I just watch and I'm like, wow, if I would have tried that or if I would have done that, I would have been dead. Like a guy would have just cross checked me in the face and dealt with it in a different way. You just don't even try to, you know, do these things. And I don't know, it's just a, it's just a different different game so i don't know different. i'm kind of it, on the it changed every year you know especially in the decades and i think when bob was watching it um after he retired i mean gosh i think he really only watched playoff hockey after yeah. he retired and noticing the changes and oh my gosh hearing his commentary i really do miss that i think he made us watching hockey more <laughs> interesting just hearing his play-by-play -play. it was awesome but um no we don't really watch now and uh with the fighting and and I mean, gosh, I think you and I addressed it last time. I didn't mind watching Bob. I, I knew, like, but there was also a code back then. Yes. Well, that's the thing now. I think until they find a more effective way to prevent these assholes from making, like, potentially career-ending cheap shots, there's a place for fighting in hockey. Love that. Hold on. I got something for you. <laughs> <laughs> was gonna bust you over there. Before, before we go what jersey are you wearing right now like is that is and daddy's jersey? is that actually one of his jerseys that og no no just the one that you made you guys, it's too you guys clean there's no blood on it those ones are upstairs though i'll show them when you no, go i did down. grab this one from upstairs yeah no but this is nice and cold it has crease marks ah that's new <laughs> well Daddies don't look so good. They're no. fringy looking. No, and yeah, they're probably ripped all along the collar or wherever too, right? Oh, yeah. There's a few of those. A few seriously with some some blood stains on them. Yep. So I'll show those to you gladly. I, I we have a good collection. I can't wait. It would be an absolute honor. And like, yeah, I just, I love you guys so much and can't wait to see you. Thank you so much for doing this. Brady, we love you. I appreciate you guys so much. And uh, I guess we'll see you in a couple of weeks. You got it. Yes. Okay. Bye, ladies. Bye. All right, guys. That is Danny, Tierney, and Declan Probert. Thank you, ladies, so much for, for coming on the show. Um, wow. It's a lot to digest. I'm trying to get this picture up here. We got text messages coming in. Um, I'm going to wrap up the show here in a couple minutes. June is Pride Month uh, right now. 
course, you guys know if you've watched the show, after Curtis Gabriel came on, he's become a good friend. Uh, currently was with the Chicago Blackhawks last season up and down. Um, he shared his story um, on my podcast and and how he became an ally and, and through s- supporting the LGBTQ community. And it kind of really opened my eyes because during that uh, conversation, you know, I shared some of the stuff that I went through, um, you know, as a kid being abused and then hearing some of these homophobic slurs and stuff like that in the hockey dressing room, it really put me in a shell and it just kind of woke me up to some of the language that people use and, and what that can do, whether it's somebody who's uh, openly gay in the closet, not gay at all, somebody who's gone through trauma, traumatic experiences like myself, where I heard that and people getting labeled as, you know, uh, with stuff that probably wasn't even true and their lives being essentially ruined through school. And I was like, yeah, that's never going to happen to me. So I'm never telling anybody what happened to me. And then that manifested into severe mental illness and addiction. And I'm very lucky uh, to be able to sit here and tell my story. Um, so through talking to Curtis um, and then Brock McGillis, of course, and then uh, linking up with the people over at Pride Tape, Jeff and Dean, they do incredible work. They're all through the NHL now. I mentioned on the last podcast, I think I'm looking for it here somewhere. They, they're coming out with a new book. I have one of the first copies. And for the next couple of weeks, uh, anyone who orders from Puck Support is going to get a roll of Pride Tape. So I'm just going to play the ad quickly, which also needs to be updated because these pictures of me just crack me up. So anyways, a quick message from Pride Tape and we'll come back and wrap up the show. Hockey to Hell and Back is brought to you by Pride Tape. Pride Tape is a badge of support from teammates, coaches, parents, and pros to young LGBTQ players. It shows every player that they belong playing the sport they love and that we're all on the same team. Show your support for teammates, coaches, and fans in the LGBTQ community by wrapping your stick with Pride Tape. Every roll of tape will make an impact in sports and beyond. Inclusion starts with leadership. Check out some of the ideas of how you can get involved at youcanplayproject.org. Check out Pride Tape at pridetape.com. For more information, you can send an email to Aubrey at pridetape.com. That's A-U-B-R-E-E, Aubrey at pridetape.com. You can find Pride Tape on facebook.com slash pride tape, on Twitter at pride tape, and at pride tape on Instagram. Pride Tape thanks all of you for being champions for change. Thank you to the people over at Pride Tape. I'm just looking at my phone here because Graham Bonner sent me some awesome pictures that I didn't see of him and Proby winning the Mem Cup in the Sioux back in the day. There's a couple more here too, I think. But Graham, you're an incredible guy. I love you so much. And he's going to be on the show again in the near future. He's came on, shared his story. But since then, him and I have become pretty, pretty close and uh, can't wait to get him back on the show. I love seeing these these pictures uh, from back in the day, like just young kids on top of the world, just winning Mem Cups, no big deal. Thanks for sharing that, Bones. I wish I would have been able to upload it. Brody says those are awesome. Lindsay Schmidt, Daniel Miner's sister. Daniel is right here behind me, always says... Thank you very much, Probert family, for sharing your story and being so honest. It is never easy, but needs to be done. Sharing our stories will hopefully help others. Um, thank you to Lindsay. I'm sure Tom and Michelle Miner are watching too, and they've become very close um, to myself and Puck Support um, through their son and, and Lindsay's brother, Daniel Miner, who played for the Barry Colts and passed away just over a year ago. And um, they were a big part of the tournament uh, that we were in the four on four tournament. They came up, they spent the weekend. Uh, Lindsay's husband played in the tournament and it was just a tremendous, tremendous weekend. It was, um, it was hard. It was emotional. Uh, we were all there playing in honor of hockey players who had passed away. Um, but what an amazing weekend. And they were just such a big part of that. And, I just love you guys so much and I'm planning, I know I've been saying this, but I'm saying it, I'm planning a trip to come down and fish with Tom. They have a fishing outfit down there in Dunville uh, and 
I've been telling them for like a year, I'm coming out on the boat. I love being out on boats. I love fishing. They do uh, commercial fishing and he's sending me texts every day. It's like, I got a thousand pounds of perch today. I got this today. Sending me sunsets and all sorts of amazing stuff. And I, I got to get down there. I feel like I just got to get down there. Eat some fish and chips at the Thirsty Mate. If you're ever in the Dunville area, go see Michelle Miner at the Thirsty Mate down at the, down at the wharf there, down at the docks. Um, anyways, that's it. For me, we're going to be back Monday night with Chris Knuckles Nyland. If you haven't seen his podcast, the Raw Knuckles podcast, honestly, check it out. Chris Nyland is one of the funniest guys. Um, he called me the other morning at like 730. I hadn't talked to him in like a year and a half. I mean, I think I texted him a couple of times. <laughs> I'm in bed and my phone rings and it's like Chris Nyland. And I'm like, oh, this ought to be good, right? I'm like, this is awesome. This is how I start my day. And he's like, hey, Brady, I'm going to come back on your show and you're going to come on my show. He's like, I'm like, all right, I'm in. Just you tell me when. He's like, when can I come on your show? I'm like, I don't know, next Monday. And he's like, I'm there. He's like, and then we'll go from there. So I've been watching and listening to his stuff and his stories are, are just incredible. So next week, Monday night, 8 p.m. with Chris knuckles nyland um shout out to my good buddy spencer jenkins he's going across the country right now you guys have probably seen him on social media he came up and spent the day with me uh, as he toured muskoka we got on the blades and got to hang out and shoot the shit for a little bit he's hilarious all over social media also tiny beast abby all the way from illinois got to take her and an amazing group of kids to the rink of dreams uh that was just a few days ago and thank you to David and Elise down at the Rink of Dreams. Abby had this dream of going to this beautiful place that she's seen on social media for the last couple of years. And when I found out she was playing in a tournament in Toronto, I messaged Elise. And within minutes, there was a group chat on Instagram with her planning an event. And it was just amazing. An amazing day. Anytime I get to go to the Rink of Dreams. So thank you to them. If anyone is in the GTA, Barry... Muskoka, North Bay, Wasega Beach, those kind of areas. Hit me up. I'm doing skills training if you want. If you're looking for training, we have camps in Aurelia and North Bay this summer. I am looking for AAA level kids right now. And there will be a time when I will coach uh, maybe lower levels. But right now I'm looking for AAA level kids who are looking to take that next step. And it's so much more about hockey for me. It's about developing that per personal relationship and um, helping them navigate through life, not just hockey, because I don't care who you are at some point in time in your life. Somebody's going to be like, yeah, you're not playing anymore. And, and you can play for fun, but it, there's a difference between living and breathing for hockey. And that's all you do. And then when it's gone, it, uh, it can be a recipe for disaster. And also moving away from home was a really difficult thing for me. And still to this day, I have many players who I speak with throughout different junior leagues right across Canada, the United States who are going through or were going through during the season, some of the same stuff that I went through and so many other guys in, in past had gone through as well. So I think it's really important to have these kind of conversations and there's coaches out there that do amazing stuff on the ice, but that's where they leave it and that's fine. And that's up to them. But for me, it's just about so much more than that. So Hit me up on social media. If you're interested, you have a, a son or daughter, please send them my way. It's just a gift to be on the ice. Anyways, guys, we'll see you back Monday night with Chris Knuckles Nyland. Until then, take care of each other. Be kind. Stay grateful. And remember, have a great day if you so choose. I want the real stuff, everybody listen up Cause I'll only say it once, I'ma show you all the path If you want it bad, I'ma show you every side Yeah, how you can get it back, yeah, cause I ain't never done I'll be number one, working hella hard until I get just what I want Yeah, rise just like the sun, yeah, fade like a gun Shooter's gonna shoot and I'm gonna shoot until I fall yeah. Always do it alone, so I gotta get through it And the only thing I know 
boys to love what I'm doing. Never give up, never slow till I finally prove it. Never listen to the no's, I just wanna keep moving. Yeah, I put out all the heart, it's my only medicine. Yeah, everything I do, I'm just being genuine. Yeah, I'm sick of being screwed, feel my own adrenaline. Yeah, I do just what I do, and I hope you let me in, let me in. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.